Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Marketing in Hard Times, presented by Beyond Indigo Pets and MWI. My name is Will Lindis and I'm the Director of Operations with Beyond Indigo Pets. We're going to begin in just one minute, but before we do, I wanted to call everyone's attention to the Q&A section of their Zoom webinar display. Now, you can use this section to ask any questions you may have about the topic, and at the end of the presentation, we're going to tackle every single one of those questions. All right, so the truth of the matter is, is that life ebbs and life flows. When running a business, there's gonna be those inevitable moments of financial uncertainty. These could be short term, maybe uh, a new competitor's opened up in your area, maybe there's some sort of local um, economic or disaster event which has disrupted the cash flow of your client base or for yourself. Maybe this is something even more long term, like a financial recession or stock market instability, something like that pops up. Whether it be short-term, long-term, local, national, global, it's important to think about how marketing can help your business sail through those low tides of life. There's a lot of preparation you can do ahead of time, and you can develop a toolkit, which is what we're going to talk about today, um, just to help keep the panic at bay. Because as with everything, preparedness is key. So what are some of the tips that you need to know when you're developing your own marketing in hard times toolkit? Well, first of all, you need to identify which of your services are what we would call a must and affordable for your clients. Think about the uh, a little bit can go a long way concept here. What services should a pet owner do that are low cost, but which would prevent bigger health and financial problems down the road? Think about catchy concepts like health for under $100. People will want to know the exact amount that they will spend before they walk through the door. Also, during hard times, it's important to train the staff that upsetting or emotion-inducing services and products might not go over very well, and they might deter people from coming through the door. That doesn't mean that you don't sell these products, and it doesn't mean that you don't have those conversations. But the way that tra that your staff presents these um, and the way that they're marketed to your clients is going to have to shift because a lot of times people start to think about healthcare and wellness as a luxury as instead of a must. But the important thing again is to figuring out what are those must services and how can they be used in marketing campaigns through the tough times. For a lot of uh, practices, those of, these, of course, are going to be your bread and butter things um, between um, vaccination protocols, um, spay and neuter, um, emergency or general um, checkup type things. Um, of course, in your specialty practice, um, you'll need to figure out what your bread and butter is because that is going to vary practice to practice. When looking at the musts, one of the most important, uh, in my mind at least, is to focus on preventive and wellness care. Um, I think this is one of the things that during economic hard times, people are very, very quick to sort of cut out of their budget. Their logic is, well, times are tough, so maybe it's just a little easier for me to save some money by only, only doing uh, wellness for emergencies or air quotes, important things. Here's the thing, and you know this as well as I do. Um, every veterinary practice has had so many of these different stories about customers who skipped their regular wellness care stuff. That could be uh, checkups, your vaccination protocols, dental cleanings, and ended up having to pay a significantly higher price tag when something inevitably went wrong. So this means that you should position the discussions in your marketing, especially during hard times, um, in terms to help customers understand just how crucial preventive care is. I think of it a lot like my car. Um, I can pay a little bit now and I can have the oil changed. Or I can skip it and you know save some money today. But I know that I'm going to be paying a lot more money down the road when my engine inevitably fails. A dental cleaning now is going to cost a lot less than an extraction later. So when people are in that panic mindset, how do I save money? How do I? It's important to bring people back to the 
how will this save me money in the long-term discussion? Of course, to make this happen, there has to be a focus on education. As with anything, customers rely very heavily on a what's in it for me mindset. This comes from making any financial decision, but especially when they have to tighten their belt. Your marketing efforts should always be able to help clients answer this question when it comes to deciding on your services, but especially so when times are tough. Make sure that your digital marketing, especially your social media posting, since social media is very conversational in, um, in tone, and that's, that's its structure, that's what it's there for. Make sure that all of this marketing is educational, conversational, and comes across as not uh, too salesy. Um, I think that that type of approach, when, when you come across like a huckster or coming across like a used car salesman, it puts people on edge. It makes people think, well, this person just wants my money. When in truth, you're providing a valuable service that can help save the life um, and the well-being and the health and the happiness of, of this particular pet. And so using education to help explain the whys behind things, the what's in it for me for the pet owner is very, very crucial. I also think that it's important to educate yourself. Um, we're seeing more and more of these billboards across the United States for ready.gov, which is um, a website run by the government with personal and uh, business disaster preparedness tool toolkits. If you just go to ready.gov slash business, you're going to see a bunch of tips there to prepare your business uh, with resources like um, what to do during a hurricane, what to do during earthquakes, what to do during floodings, what to do during a technological failure like um, electrical grid and stuff like that. Um, if you haven't figured out what your practice is going to do during those very specific um, uh, weather style disasters, you should do so. Again, ready.gov slash business will help you there. You can also use things like coupons and promotions. As with all of us, customers love savings. Coupons and promotions can be a very effective way to communicate those savings, but they also require a little bit of extra work on the part of your veterinary practice. As such, they should be used sparingly, but pinpoint, because they do have a place in your marketing. Coupons and promotions should be targeted both in terms of savings and in terms of time frame, and they should always communicate value. For example, you might run a 10% dental discount through February for um, National Pet Dental Health Month. Um, if you run something along those lines, it's going to create a sense of urgency that um, an open coupon, something that doesn't expire, that that might not generate. You can then market this coupon a variety of different ways, utilizing the other tips that we've talked about in this list. You know, if you're doing a, uh, if you're, you know, pairing a couple of things together, you might be able to take a look at what your must items are. Um, if one of those must items is a wellness package or a wellness protocol that you've developed in your area, develop a short time frame coupon, you know, use, useful between now and the end of the month, useful between now and March 15th or whatever it is that gives some sort of savings and then use education in the marketing of it to explain that it's not just buy this thing for 10% off, but here's what you get from that. Here's why this is important. What's in it for me as the consumer? Well, this is what's in it for you. All of those things should go together with when you do a coupon because otherwise a coupon that doesn't have focus becomes actually a liability instead of an asset for your business because it can, you know, we've seen people who have created, um, poor coupons and it's actually you know cost them money in the long run so um, just make sure that when you're using these you're using a lot of specificity so in the last example i gave i, I we used a coupon that included like a 10 percent discount um, a lot of times that can be effective but another technique is to market by cost instead of by discount there's this natural tendency for us all to use percentage discounts in our marketing. Hey, come in today. Dental cleaning services are 10% off through the end of the month. Um, and this technique, as we just talked about, can, can very definitely work. 
but sometimes sometimes 10% off can feel a bit like a mystery number. Um, clients are going to say, well, 10% off of what? And then at that point, their mind starts like adding up things. You know, we've all been in that situation where we've been terrified of getting that surprise gotcha bill again, whether it be at the, the auto shop or at the doctor's office with any type of thing that we purchase, we're afraid that 10% off is not going to be uh, all that great in the grand scheme of things when I'm still paying hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of dollars. So for some services, especially your low cost services, it's going to be way more effective to give clients a tangible number. Think about what these low cost services are and how you can communicate both the cost and the value to your clients. A really, really good example of one is something like $5 nail trims. There's no percentage discount. There's no thing along those lines. It's just my nail trimmings are going to be $5 or $10 or whatever it's worth to you as the practice. What's great about this is that it's a very effective way to get tails in the door. It's um, the type of thing where people say, well, yeah, um, I, I have noticed my dog's nails have been a little too long. I'm hearing that click, clack, click, clack whenever they walk across the kitchen floor. Maybe I should do something about this. Um, and once they're in the door, there's this natural inclination for people to sort of be, to sort of defer um, healthcare services um, when they can do so from the comfort of their own home. But when they're actually in the practice and you're already doing the nail trimming and it's a lot easier for them to say, well, while I'm here, I might as well schedule that appointment. While I'm here, oh yeah, I guess I am lax on my vaccinations. I guess I need to do that. Um, people are much more open to discussing those health concerns once you get them in the door. So. Um, low cost uh, nail trimmings, great way to do that. Um, next up is knowing the best way to reach your clients. And this is both your current and your future clients. What's the best way for you to reach your current clients very, very quickly? In the case of an emergency, how do you get in touch with people? Do you have a clean email list on hand right now? that you can use to shoot out an email within the next 30 minutes, if need be. If not, that's a priority. You need to have that email list on hand. What about text messaging? Um, some practices use um, different um, text messaging programs and applications to keep in touch, whether it be through uh, reminders or um, you know, group messages, those types of things. It's having this type of information with, again, current emails, and cell phone numbers can immensely help you to reach people quickly. People tend to calm down a lot more quickly once they hear from others that they're not alone. Um, so a couple of examples of how this might play out. Uh, maybe a major business um, just closed down in your town. A text message saying something along the lines of, you know, we're here for you during these tough times can help give them peace of mind. For future clients, you should also think about how are they finding services in your area, in your city, your town, in your zip code. Um, for a lot of areas, Google is actually going to be used more than Facebook. So these are situations where paying for marketing to make sure that you have good Google placement for your website, making sure that you're running effective AdWords campaigns to make sure that you're both pay-per-click advertising and your organic search rankings through Google um, puts you in a competitive spot in your area. In some spots, Facebook is way more appropriate um, just because it's what's used more. And in that case, you need to make sure that you have a large enough, large enough um, viral reach. In other words, you need to have a large number of followers and you need to have um, a large number of those followers engaged with your uh, information so that they can see your organic uh, postings as well as your um, Facebook ads. You should be using boosting and um, advertisements effectively for those clients. Some areas you need a combination of the two, and it's important for you to figure out what type of area you live in so that you can market effectively. Um, of course, in some areas, um, it might be word of mouth that's much more important. I know that this, this is primarily digital marketing that we're talking about, but it's important to keep in mind how to reach people quickly for your area. So in some cases, that could mean that doing a radio ad or um, calling local service groups like the Lions uh, organization. 
um, they can help you spread the word that you're here to help during the hard time. And it can also be effective, especially if it's, um, if it's a, something along the lines of a local disaster that you're explaining what it is that you're able to do. I know that some practices, um, like if there's been a weather disaster, um, hurricanes, earthquakes, something in the area, if your practice is still up and running and still effective and you're doing things along the lines of, hey, if you need some place to board your pets, we're doing a discount um, during this next little bit or um, we're taking in free strays or whatever it happens to be, depending on the severity of things. Um, getting that message out so that people know what to do because I, I'm a pet owner and I know that, um, and, and so, as so many other pet owners too, if there was a disaster and I didn't know what to do with my pet during the short term, like that's an extra stressor, that's an extra thing. So if that's a service that you are able to provide for your area, make sure that you're utilizing all of these different social and email and text and radio, whatever makes the most sense for your area to get that word out. One of your biggest resources is actually gonna be your staff. So talk to your staff and ask them, how can we help our clients to not panic? Every hospital is gonna have different demographics that you cater to and all of your needs are gonna be very, very different. Um, maybe the top 20% of clients um, are the ones that make up 80% of your revenue. That's very common for a lot of areas. Um, so for these specific clients, especially in the case of like, um, you know, maybe competitors coming into town or just recession, those types of things, I think that it warrants having a personal phone call with them, just reaching out to them, making sure everything's okay. Um, maybe if you're in, um, if, if you service also some poorer areas, maybe you could do something along the lines of setting up like a remote site clinic that can be set up for a day to help reach people who might have a difficult time reaching the hospital for whatever reason. But make sure you're leveraging your staff, finding out what techniques would help them if they were in their client's shoes. And you'd be surprised how many great ideas you're going to get. It's also important to set aside a rainy day marketing fund. Um, and this is hard for people because a lot of times when you think about marketing, you're thinking about, okay, well, I've got a budget of X dollars to spend every month. So that's what I'm going to spend this month. That's exactly what I'm going to budget. That's exactly what I'm going to spend. The problem is, is that during hard times, a business actually needs to market more, not less. So my strong recommendation is whatever you set aside for your monthly uh, marketing budget, set aside just a little bit extra and put it aside so that when some sort of emergency happens, you have that extra pool of cash to pull from. Um, especially, you know, a new competitor is coming into the area. You need to make sure that your message is, is loud and clear during that time. Um, and that can, that can feel weird. Like, Hey, if, if people are struggling, if my business is, um, you know, facing hardship because of what's happening in the area or what's happening on the global scene, like, why should I spend more money? Why shouldn't I spend less? Um, mental floss recently did this really great article about five different companies that survived during the great depression. And um, I'm not going to go through all of those now because, it, but it's a very fascinating, um, discussion, but one in particular really stood out to me. Um, and it's the movie industry. Um, so a little bit of history there. Um, you know, of course, the Great Depression uh, began sort of like the late um, uh, 1929 era, which was really, really, really bad time for the film industry because it had just recently evolved into this more robust thing with the 1927 release of The Jazz Singer, which was this very milestone talky picture. So the industry is gaining all of this momentum, and then all of a sudden, unemployment shoots up. And people don't have disposable income for um, entertainment. Well, a lot of movie houses during this time had to shutter their doors because of decreased traffic. And so through the 30s, um, a lot of those once profitable studios are losing all of this money. So this is when the film industry got really creative. Um, to give, them max, give customers maximum bang for their buck, some of them cut prices by 50% or more or started giving like two features for the price of one, those types of things which helped prop up um, also demand for like kind of cheaply made like uh, B movies during this time. So you got to see, um, instead of just these huge monolithic films, you got to see a lot of these other smaller houses coming up. And I think about that a lot like uh, the veterinary services that you do. 
you know, maybe you're not going to be able to sell just your luxury services only, your high-end specialties, but you might be able to keep yourself afloat through some of your um, lower cost, um, higher value um, to customers at least um, uh, products. You got to see even a lot of other um, kind of fascinating marketing techniques during this time. Um, you'd see a lot of movie houses that would do things like doing giveaways to fill their seats, uh, promotions like dish night in which um, any woman who attended got a free dinner plate. They did cash door prizes, silverware giveaways. Um, and so if you wanted to build up that complete set of flatware, you had to keep going to see movies. Because of the funneling of additional resources, um, discounts, and just keeping that marketing in terms of like what you get out of um, coming to our movies um, during the Depression, you got to see box office takes took a dive, as everything did, um, down to like 480 million in 1933, climbing over double that to 810 million by 1941. And a good portion of that is because of a lot of these disaster management tricks. So Obviously, you are not in an entertainment uh, industry. You all are in um, healthcare and wellness, but a lot of these techniques still translate and can still be beneficial for your practice. Of course, if there's something happening on the local um, scene, um, you're not gonna be the only one that's affected. Um, so it's very important to develop relationships with other key businesses in town. When hard times hit, it's going to affect the whole town or at least multiple vendors within a sector of your area. So these strong relationships with other owners of businesses in town are going to allow group advertising and efforts during this hard time. So maybe a cluster of businesses can put on an event where people can come and receive a variety of services all at once for a low admission price. Uh, an example of this might be doing something like if you don't do um, grooming, uh, for example, um, on practice, you know, or you, maybe you have some sort of like local event where, you know, you have groomers and boarders and everyone just sort of coming together and providing like a pet um, safety and wellness and health and well-being day. Um, pets in the park, whatever you call that. Um, you could also maybe do a full-size newspaper ad but split the cost of it like four ways between different businesses so that you get that full visibility, but you're only having to pay a section of it. Um, having those ties now means that putting something in place will only take a phone call because speed can really matter in these types of matters. So don't wait until things are kind of dicey to start building these relationships. Build them now so that if you need to partner with someone else, even if it's just doing referral traffic, whatever, um, that it's much easier to do so. A lot of the topics that we talked about today have been very much from a broad perspective because every business is going to have very, very different needs. Um, and so this the, today's toolkit was really about giving you the understanding of which techniques to try for you to then customize and tailor them to your business. It's going to vary practice to practice. I think one of the most important takeaways from this session should be that preparedness does not have to be this fatalistic endeavor. I think a lot of businesses employ um, an optimistic attitude with their business, which is absolutely wonderful, but sometimes they'll do so with blinders on to the potential of financial hard time. We think, well, things are going well right now. Therefore, things are always going to go well. And if I start thinking about how things may not go well, then I'm dooming myself or um, I'm not enjoying the moment. And I think that the fact of the matter is, if you develop a hard times toolkit for your business right now, if you know what you want to market, how you want to market it, through which methods and how you're going to pay for all of that, if you know that now, you're going to have peace of mind Hopefully disaster never happens, but you'll have peace of mind if it does. With that in mind though, um, I would like to open the floor to any questions that any of our attendees may have. If you have those questions, please just type them in the chat window and I'd be very, very happy to answer them.
All right, I'm not seeing any questions come through, which is very okay. There's a lot to take in here. Um, so I guess I'd like to wrap up by first of all, um, letting everyone know that like, look, you don't have to do all of this alone. There's a lot of information that we went over here and you don't have to feel as though you have to come up with all of this from scratch. If you wanna help get more tales to just sail through your door, um, both during times of prosperity and during hardship, we can help you with that. Um, just give us a call here at Beyond Indigo Pets and we'll help you focus on your goals and find new ways to market to existing and uh, potential uh, clients. Again, we wanna get those tales through your door. We've been doing internet marketing for 20 plus years um, with a focus on real results based on real numbers. And we're always committed to staying up to date with the changing online environment. Um, oh, I do have a question here. What would be a good solution if you hit a lull in a marketing campaign? Um, that's a very, very good question. Um, a lot of times when you have a lull in a marketing campaign, it means that you need to potentially change up your strategy. Um, so the first thing to do is to look at the, what your marketing campaign has been. Was it effective in the past? If so, um, and it's only hitting a short-term lull, I would suggest letting it ride out just a hair longer because any campaign is going to have peaks and it's gonna have valleys. And if you stop a good thing just when it happens to be hitting one of those valleys, um, you may be shooting yourself in the foot. But at the same time, um, I think a lot of practices end up just doing what once worked and never changing thing up, things up from there at all. So um, in those cases, once you've identified that, yeah, okay, this marketing campaign has stalled out, it's not getting the bang uh, that it used to get for the buck, that's when you need to change something up. Um, you either need to change up your message, um, how you're delivering that marketing, you need to change up your um, method, um, you know, maybe switching more to a, um, if you've been doing organic through um, social media, maybe you need to be doing a pay-per-click ad, or maybe you need to be switching over to Google AdWords and trying some things there. Um, I think you also need to make sure that with any marketing campaign that you're looking at the numbers very, very regularly, and you're doing some good analysis on what those numbers mean. Um, if you run a campaign and you got 40 new likes for your Facebook page, you need to know whether for your practice um, and this will be the case, some practices 40 new likes is a fantastic um, gain. For some practices, $40 or 40 new likes might be a failed campaign because um, of the number of likes that you already have in an area. So um, I guess the kind of the, sh the short answer to it is make sure that you know for a fact that it is a lulled campaign and if so, change something up. Um, a lot of times with digital marketing, since you're not dealing with um, I've got to get this print ad to the newspaper. Or I've got to get this print thing at the back of the, the phone book. Um, you can change things up relatively quickly, do a lot of like, um, okay, well, let's tweak this, let's tweak that, and get real results um, fed back to you, successful or failed, uh, within a very short period of time. And I think that's where marketing is really most successful is when you do a lot of the fine tuning, a lot of the tweaking along the way is to see if, um, see how things are working. So that'd be my first bet. Look at the numbers. And if you're for sure that um, you've got the lull, then I would ch change something up, try a different approach, try a different technique. And again, some of that can be hard. Um, and if you need help identifying whether a campaign is successful or not, um, that's something that we can help with as well. Um, you just reach out to us. I've got a few pieces of um, content here on the screen for you. Um, of course, our website, uh, beyondindigopets.com. Uh, I'm always available on will at beyondindigo.com. And of course, we have a number, 877-244-9322, uh, extension 100, if you'd like to find out a little bit more about what we do. I want to thank every single one of you for coming today. Um, I know that it can be scary to think about the hard times and disaster scenarios, um, but I think even just starting to put this in your brain and letting it rattle around a little bit puts you one leg up over anyone that you know hasn't started having these conversations and hasn't started thinking about this. And I'd also like to thank MWI so much for helping to host this today. Thank you, everyone.